Welcome to The Porch Online. We're so excited that you're joining us this week. If you're close enough to The Porch, we wanna invite you to come join us in person. And if you're not, we're gonna encourage you to join a local church in your community because here at The Porch, we believe gathering is extremely important because we believe that you can go fast alone, but you'll go farther together. We hope that you enjoy this week's message and learn something new about God. There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. How's it going today? I'm so privileged and honored to be with you this morning. I'm turning off my uh, Wi-Fi because sometimes if people call me, my iPad rings and then my computer rings and then my phone rings. And so I want to make sure my Wi-Fi is off because I don't want that to happen today. <laughs> it's like uh, the most uh, obnoxious, loud noise in the world and it bothers me to pieces, but I don't know how to turn it off on my iPad. So if anybody wants to help me later, be more than happy to receive that help. Anyway, I'm just all teasing aside. I'm so glad to see you here um, this weekend at the porch. There is a lot of different uh, places that you could be this weekend, whether it be different churches or at the lake, like a lot of people are. I've watched my brother and his family rolling around at their lake. My niece is like the cutest human on earth in her little life vest, so I love to see her. But I'm so glad that you're here today. And if you want to follow along with the notes, we got the QR code up top. You can follow along. It'll send you right to the Bible app. Or on the back side of your bulletin, there's also um, notes, a place for you to take notes, fill in the blanks kind of for my points that I go through. But like I said, it really is a privilege and an honor to be here at church with you. And if you're joining us online, we are so privileged to have you here this week. And we want to invite you to come join us in person. If you're not close enough to the porch, we want you to get involved in a local community that's close to you while still attending the porch online because we know here at the porch that we can go fast alone, but we'll go farther together. Gathering is so important. So today we're going to talk about who is God. This is our final series. So if you haven't been with us over the seven weeks that it took to get to this point, and I think a lot of us, especially since we have a lot of parents in this room, have been waiting for this exact sermon, part of this sermon series, for this exact sermon, because we're going to hit on something that maybe is a little bit terrifying if you're a parent. At least to me, I don't have children yet, but I, I can imagine that as a parent, this may be a moment that gives me pause but before we get into that, I told you I would say three things every week. And the very first thing that I want to tell you this week is A.W. Tozer says that what you think, what comes into your mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us, right? Because God created us in his image, in his likeness. We have another God on the throne of our heart. We're going to start looking like that. Think about people who have a love of money or material things, what are they going to do? They're going to do any and everything they can to get all the material things that they can possibly get their hands on. They're going to step on people. They're going to not care about their families. They're going to do everything they can to get money. People who, you know, have different things on their heart will do different things. They're, you know, there's that moment of, oh, I, I, really have the desire to sit in front of my computer and play a video game, so all else doesn't matter. Relationships, um, time with my family doesn't matter. I'm going to spend time diving into and, and playing that video game. i got to get home so I can play a game or watch a TV show, or it could be even worse than that. Drugs, alcohol, it keeps going down the list. So what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about that. And as we close this sermon series for this week, I want to remind us that in Isaiah 40, verse 12, that it says so simply, who has measured the depths of the water with the hollow of his hand or the, with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? God can literally hold the entirety of the water on the earth in the palm of his hand. That's not even satisfying for me to take a drink out of cupped hands for water. But he can hold the entire thing and, and just his hand, and he holds the universe, and he's so big, right? Seven weeks is not going to encompass, by any stretch of the imagination, the entirety of who God is. But it's going to give us a really solid starting point. Why? Because, well, we got to go to the source, and the source is this, 
God himself tells us in Exodus 34, verse 6 through 7, it says, And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And if you're not familiar, this is the part that the parents maybe have been waiting for to get to, like, Cooper, let's talk about this. What's going on here with, with what God says? Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebe- or forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. Let's pray. Jesus, as we come before you today, I pray that you would uh, soften our hearts, that you would Speak to us directly that, Father, that as you, spoke, as you speak through me today, I pray that anything that is of Cooper gets out of the way and everything that is of the Holy Spirit hits a chord in the places and spaces that it needs to hit. God, we appreciate and love the fact that we get, together, get to come together under the banner of heaven and celebrate with the angels today. And God, we just want to honor you and love you. We thank you for this day and we thank you for this time together. And it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. So I was watching Hamilton last night. I love it. It's my favorite uh, musical. I don't know why. It just is. Used to be Wicked. And before that, it was, uh, it was uh, The Greatest Showman, which can you really... It is a musical, but it's like a movie, not a, not a traditional like Broadway musical, right? So we're watching Hamilton last night, and I started to cry. It has nothing to do with what I'm about to tell you, but I was like crying, and my wife had to console me for a little bit because I was like... I don't, I don't want you to die, because we got to the part where he's, he gets shot and dies at the very end. But anyway, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is there's a moment in time where uh, Philip Hamilton is walking around looking for this guy specifically, and the guy is uh, George Eaker, and historically in Hamilton, it's a little off. It's obviously a Broadway show, so it's not as accurate, but he's looking for this guy because he disparaged his father's name, Alexander Hamilton's name. And so he's seeking him out. He's like, I'm going to go take care of this. You're not going to talk about my father like this. Why? Because Alexander had done pretty much everything he could to be this legacy-leaving, giving person, but also made a really big fool of himself when he decided to write the Reynolds pamphlets, and so people found out about something that they sh- he shouldn't have done in the first place, but he also was called a scoundrel for it. And so Philip goes, and he tries to address this with this man. Well, they end up getting in a duel. I don't know if you've ever seen it, and this is all true, the fact that they get in a duel, and uh, George Egert actually kills Philip Hamilton. And in the, TV sh- or in the, in the Broadway musical, he kills him too. And I, I begin to think, what if... Alexander Hamilton would have been a little less abrasive. Maybe if he wouldn't have made the mistake of having an affair and sleeping with another woman when he was married, if his son may have lived past the age of 19 years old. And I think about those things, and was it a direct response by George Eaker to attack and, and approach Philip Hamilton, no, Philip Hamilton went after George Eaker, so it's not like George Eaker came and attacked him directly, but I wonder if Hamilton would have lived a life above reproach if there would have ever been a conversation between Philip Hamilton and George Eaker. Like, I wonder if Philip Hamilton would have ever even had to defend his father's name had his father operated in a way that there was no need for his name to be defended. I think about that, and I think about what we're going to talk about today. And I know there's a lot of parents in here, so bear with me because we've got a lot of, of scripture to get through. Usually it's like one or two words, but we're going to start at maintaining love to thousands and go all the way to generation, third or fourth generation. So first, let's, let's focus on this reality of who God is. God is forgiving. You see, forgiveness is this concept that we begin as Christians to think 
happened when Jesus came and died on the cross. Oh, Jesus came, he died on the cross, and now my sins are forgiven. Well, if you actually know God, God didn't just become forgiving all of a sudden when Jesus came. He's like, oh, okay, now I'll be forgiving because I put Jesus in your place and not you. No, God has been forgiving since the very beginning of time. Since the very beginning of our creation, God has forgiven. Watch this. Adam and Eve eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what is their punishment supposed to be? Immediately, their punish punishment is supposed to be death. Does anybody know what they actually get instead of death? They get banished. They don't get to stay in the garden. But God doesn't kill them immediately. Tell me that's not forgiving. Right out the gate. His very first interaction with humanity is, is loving, compassion. They break his one rule, one rule, that was it, just don't eat this tree. And God says, instead of dying, I'm going to keep you from dying, and I'm going to make sure that you conquer the serpent, that humanity steps, really it's Jesus, it's the first time we see the prophecy of Jesus is coming, that he steps on the serpent's head. So we think about this, and we see this in Exodus 34, verse 7. It says, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is who God is. It's who he's always been. Never did it change. And you'll hear this argument a lot from people who don't really know the Bible, Christians and, and non-believers alike. They'll be like, well, you know, that, that was Old Testament God. He's mean. He's, he's wrathful. He's all of these things. Well, he's not. He's forgiving to thousands, maintaining his love, forgiving their wickedness, their rebellion, and their sin from the very, very beginning. And if you actually read the scriptures, not through a lens of, oh, here comes God sending another army to wipe out another nation, but you read the scriptures through the reality of God has to address the evil and sin in our lives in this world, and you realize that God is love, and if he's a loving parent, he can't tolerate evil, he can't tolerate things that are going to harm and kill you, so he has to address them, he has to right? But the reality is God is forgiven. Micah 7, verse 18 through 20, it says, who is, God, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but you delight, you enjoy, you have fun to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depth of the sea. God's been forgiving since well before Jesus came. Jesus is the culmination of his forgiveness. Jesus is the culmination where we don't have to go to the temple to sacrifice a lamb every single year. Thank goodness, because I don't know that I could sacrifice lambs. The blood would make me a little sick because I'd be the guy you'd have to come through. Don't want to do that, so let's just keep it with Jesus. Please don't bring me your lambs. Unless they're lamb chops, already cooked and ready, then I'll take them and eat them. So in Numbers 14, he says this, Now, may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger. We've heard this before. Abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. But wait for it. In accordance with your great love and forgiveness, the sins of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. Even though Moses is addressing the reality that these people are sinning, these people are operating in this place and space, he's realizing who God is. He calls on God's forgiveness. This is right before they're about to enter the promised land, and they say, no, we don't want to go in because 10 of the 12 spies said there's giants in there. They'll trample us underfoot. We'll look like grasshoppers, and God's like, no, I'm done with these people. And Moses is like, well, hold on. Hold on. Remember who you are. He calls on who God is, and God chooses to forgive. And we're going to come back to this story, so uh, keep it in the back of your mind as we continue forward. Douglas K. Stewart says this about God. He does not reluctantly forgive sins against himself and others. He does so eagerly 
as a man, manifestation of his character. You know, when you go before God and you beg for forgiveness, you don't have to sit there and, please, God, please, 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 please forgive me. He's eagerly waiting for you to ask for forgiveness. He's eagerly ready to give that forgiveness to you. It's not a matter of, God, I'm going to pay penance. God, I'm going to do this. God, I'm going to clean up my life, and I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to do this, and if you forgive me, then I'll do this. It's, it's a matter of him saying, I am eagerly, I am on the edge of my seat waiting for my sons and my daughters to ask me to forgive them so that I can show my mercy. He's forgiven. The other side of this, though, that we have to realize is God is just. We see it in Exodus 34, verse 7. It says, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes, uh, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. You see, he won't clear the guilty. There's a group of people out there that take what Jesus did on the cross and say, well, God's not sending anybody to eternal damnation and separation from him. You see, Jesus came, and salvation is for everyone. Forgiveness of sins, once and for all time, for all humanity, happened. But just like if my wife decided to buy me a brand new Xbox, I enjoy my video games from time to time, <laughs> daily, okay? Uh, if she bought me a brand new Xbox, and I left it in the box, sitting on the table of our kitchen, I would never enjoy the benefits of that Xbox. If I left it just sitting there. You see, that's the reality that a lot of people are making a decision to not accept Christ's sacrifice, so the free gift of salvation is set left setting on their table, and they don't get to enjoy or reap the benefits of it. There's also other people in this world that are anti-Christ, that are against what Jesus did. They revel in their sin. They love what they're doing. They're excited about what they get to do in their own flesh, in their own strength. And they're choosing to deny God and his forgiveness. Those are the people that he has to have justice. And believe you me, we all are wired with justice. All of us. We're created in the image of God. I mean, think about it. Think about when a school shooting occurs. Are you just like, oh, it happened again? No, you're angry. You want the person to come to justice. When somebody is abused in their home, we don't just think to ourselves like, oh, okay, well, let's just leave them in that situation. No, we want to help that person out of that situation, situation and have those people be brought to justice. We are designed in the image and likeness of God. So just like God is just, we also are just. In Amos 5, 24, it says, but let justice roll like a river. You see, God wants his justice to roll. Right now, justice seems to be trickling, right? Right now, not everybody is called into account, but there will come a day. There will come a day where everybody stands before the judgment seat of the Father. And the only thing that's going to clear any one of us is the blood of Jesus. The only thing. No matter how good of a life you live from this point on until the, the time you see God face to face, the only thing that is going to protect us from the righteous, just judgment of the Father is Jesus. In Exodus 34, verse 7, it says, He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. And I know what you're thinking, parents, and, and kind of honestly with, with my, my wife and I, where we're at in considering a family and what that means, it, it scares me too. Like the thought process of, you mean my sins are gonna, going to affect my children? How does this work? Well, can we take that at face value? Can we sit there and go, okay, God's, if I do this, God's going to punish my children for three to four generations. This is what's going to happen. Well, let's read Deuteronomy 24, 16. Parents are not to be put to death for 
their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sins. Does that sound like what we just read? No. Now, here's the thing. There's layers to what God's saying here. Is God contradicting himself? Can we say just all honesty right now? God is not contradicting himself. We have to understand what he means when he says that he's going to punish the children to the third and fourth generation. In Jeremiah 32, verse 18 through 19, we actually see this as well. It says, you show love to thousands. We've heard that well. But you bring punishment for the parents' sin and the lapse of the children after them. Great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind. Wait for it. In the same two sentences, Jeremiah says this, you reward each person according to their conducts as their deeds deserve. So hold on a second. If he punishes the children for the parents' sin to the third and fourth generation, which is true because it's in the scripture, but it's saying that back to back, you're going to be judged by your own deeds. What does this mean? Well, it means two things. Think back to that example we started with. Alexander Hamilton and Philip Hamilton. Philip did nothing. Well, I don't know his whole story, but Philip in this moment did nothing, right? He was defending the honor of his father which caused him, because his father's sins caused him to have a reason to defend the honor, it fell into his lap. I think about my nephew who was adopted. His name's Ford. He's so cute. He's the best. All of my nieces and nephews are the best. Don't get it twisted if you're watching online. I love you all. (laughs) But he's just so cute. But I remember breaks my heart because my sister sent me a video of him when he was first born and he couldn't stop shaking and shivering. He was in pain, agonizing, crying out because his mom, biological mom, couldn't stop using meth. So my sweet five-year-old nephew was born addicted to meth. He didn't choose that. He didn't get the opportunity to make that decision for himself. But when he was born, he had to go through withdrawal. He had to go through things and suffering, not because of his own choices, but because of the choices of his parents. That sin fell into his lap. I think about divorce, uh, families of divorce and their children and what they go through. The insecurity, the uncomfortability of being able to trust deeply somebody who who would love them and cherish them and actually operate in the right way. And I'm not sitting here condemning anybody. If you've been to church more than one weekend, you know that I've walked through a divorce. I'm not condemning you because here's the good news. The good news is all of this is true, but then there's the reality of Jesus and his grace. All of this is true, but it interrupts because we remember last week that one of our prophets said, in your wrath, remember mercy. You see, the reality is decisions we make have consequences, not just on ourselves, but on our children. It says this in Numbers 14. Remember, we were coming back to it. 14, 21 through 23. He says, nevertheless, as surely as I live, this is God speaking, as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and signs I performed in Egypt And in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me, they tested me 10 times. Wait a second. They've done this 10 times over. They tested him. He's slow to anger still, right? But finally, God gets angry. I want to remind you, some of you need to remember, God is slow to get angry with you. He's not angry with you the moment you make a mistake. But some of you need to remember that God is slow to get angry. And you keep repeating your actions, eventually God will get angry. But let's continue on. Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. He's talking about the parents. Go ahead and go back. I'm going to wait for a second. Sorry, I didn't uh, put this title slide in there. 
He's talking about the parents. He's talking about these people who have decided and been walking in the wilderness for about a year. They've made the decision. They want to go back to Egypt. They had rebellions. They're talking about how in slavery, they were better off than being fed for free every single day without having to do any work. All they had to do was go outside and pick up manna. Like, that's it. And they had to work. They had to build the pyramids. They had to do all these different things. And they're like, oh, it was better for us back there where we were treated like less than human. Then, and they've done this repetitively throughout this time. And finally, God's like, okay, we're going to enter the promised land. He's still like, hey, I'm still going to give this to you because I am who I am. And finally, he's like, no more. Watch this. Ten, less than 10 verses later, it says, as for your children that you said would be taken as plunder. I will bring them in to the, enjoy the land you have rejected. So they're actually going to see the promised land, the children of these people who messed up. That's good news, right? I mean, they get to go into the promised land, but here's the bad news. But as for you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. Go ahead. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for whose unfaithfulness? Your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lie in the wilderness. You see, the children didn't do anything wrong, but they had to suffer for the decisions of their parents. They were punished. They weren't punished in the sense of they didn't get to enter the promised land, but they had to wait for 40 years. Could you imagine if you were a 15-year-old and your parents made a decision and you were like, I don't get it. I have to wander the desert for 40 years because you couldn't figure it out, mom or dad. I literally was there. I saw God come down on the, on the mountain. He was massive. He's incredible. And you're complaining about giants? He was larger than the mountain. What are you talking about? Why are we so concerned about these? I would be so mad, right? I would be so mad. But they had that punishment that they had to endure for decisions that they didn't make. Think about that. We're going to touch on this a little bit, but secondly, there are generational sins. There are things that I struggle with, that my father struggled with, that my, father before, my, father's, my father's father before him struggled with, and so on. There are temptations, there are sins. But just because, let's say my dad, I don't have any specifics to share with you, but let's say my dad struggled with a sin, and the Lord punished it and addressed it in him, but then I struggled with the same sin, just because my father was punished for that sin doesn't mean that I won't be either. Hear what I'm saying. Just because my father operated in some sin, if I operate in the same sin, God's not going to be like, well, I punished your father, so I don't have to punish you. It's like, no, he has to address sin, right? Because what does sin do? It separates us from him. It brings death. The wages for sin are death. And the last thing any loving father wants to have happen to his or her or his children, father, I'm going to say parent in my head, but father, his children is death, right? We talked about it. My dad used to get mad at me for looking or walking across the street without looking both ways because he knew what could happen if a car came down the street and I didn't stop because I didn't see it. He wasn't mad at me because... I did that. He was mad because I didn't do it because he knew the, the result was not going to be positive. So let me talk about this. We already mentioned it a little bit, but number three, we, we sang it earlier. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God maintains love to thousands, and he punishes to the third or fourth. I want you to think third or fourth generation. I want you to think about this and realize this. When I was doing my study... The exact same word that comes after fourth that says generations is actually the exact same word that comes after thousands. So what the Bible is really saying there, there's no real good translation for us, so we use the word generation, but what the Bible is really saying there is it's saying he maintains his love to thousands of generations and only punishes to about three or four generations. Think about that. Think about the, out, the absolute weight of that statement. Thousands of times over, God is going to choose forgiveness before he chooses punishment. Thousands of times over. Well, if you did the math, okay, 900, 
and 97 or 996 times over, right? Thousands of generations versus three to four generations. James chapter 2, verse 13, it says, mercy triumphs over judgment. The Bible tells us that if you, there are two unforgivable sins. We're going to talk about one of them right now. It says, you will be forgiven as much as you forgive. Those who can't forgive won't be forgiven. Mercy will triumph over judgment. You may have the right, you may have the right to hold a grudge, to be bitter, to be angry, to be focused on what they did. You wouldn't imagine what they did to me. You wouldn't imagine what I've been through because of that person. But God says you don't have the right. God says as much as you forgive, you will be forgiven. I want to be forgiven completely and totally. And it's not about feelings. It's not about emotions. It's about a decision that we make as Christ followers to forgive. Mercy will always triumph over judgment. Point number four I want to make is Yahweh is forgiving. Sin is not. Yahweh is forgiving, sin is not. Do you realize God doesn't have to punish you for your sin? I mean, think about it. I mean, I'm sitting here processing. We watched Hamilton last night, and he has that affair, but I think about myself as a pastor. If I were to betray this woman's trust, and ask God for forgiveness the moment after I did it, God would forgive me. I could die the very next moment and be in heaven. No questions asked. But if I betrayed her trust and I told her about it, our marriage would be in shambles. The trust that she had in me would be gone forever. It would be a rebuilding process that I had to work through. And even though we rebuilt it, our relationship would never be the same. Not only that, as your pastor, I would lose my job. My life would literally fall apart. My income that I make, gone. The trust that you have in me to lead you, gone. The relationships that I've built in this room, gone. All of it, gone. Am I forgiven by God? Am I going to heaven? Yep. But my actions have results. And if I choose to continue a life and live a life of faithfulness, truth, honor, trust, unity, if I choose to live a life that looks like Jesus, the results will be life and life abundantly. If I choose to live a life that leads to sin, even though I'm forgiven and going to heaven, my relationships die, my jobs die, my marriage, the most trusted relationship I have dies, right? Yahweh is forgiving, sin is not. We started this uh, journey through a book called God Has a Name, and the book was written by John Mark Comer, and I haven't quoted him directly at all in any of this, but I am going to quote him directly because I think that this is so powerful to think about. It says this, and this is what I want to leave you with before we, we close together today. It says this, in spite of all the talk in the Bible about Yahweh's wrath, nobody should ever accuse Yahweh of being mean. Yes, he gets angry, but he takes that anger on himself. He doesn't make you or me pay for our sins. He pays for it with the currency of his own blood. We sin, Jesus dies. Jesus dies, we live on in relationship with our Father. <laughs> Welcome to the kingdom of heaven. How good is that? How incredible news is that? I lived a life for 10 years from the age of 14 to the age of 24. Really, from the age of 0 to the age of 33, which is how old I am right now. I've done things in my life that deserve the penalty and punishment that Jesus took on the cross for me. 
and so have you. We sin. Jesus dies. Jesus dies. We live on relationship with our Father. I started this off with saying God's forgiveness didn't start with Jesus. It didn't. I want to show you in Joel, verse 2, 12 through 14, it says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending uh, calamity. You may be sitting in this room today. You may be thinking, I'm living in sin. My life is falling apart. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the next steps are. Cooper, you just told me that everything could fall apart. Can I tell you this? That in the midst of what I described potentially happening between me and Victoria and the reality that it would mean for me losing my job and losing the trust in all of you and more importantly than anybody else in this room, and it's no offense to you, I love you all, And I will always be there to shepherd you, but she's the most important relationship in this room to me. I would lose that relationship. In the midst of that calamity, in the midst of all of those decisions, Joel says this. He says, who knows? Who knows? He may turn and relent. And not only may he relent, he may leave a blessing behind. I don't know where you're at in this room today. I don't pretend to know. It says this, grain offerings, and, uh, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. The only difference now on this side of, of, the, of the cross is instead of bringing grain offerings and, and drink offerings and sacrificial lambs is we just have to turn to Jesus. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're sitting there going, I don't want my sins to affect my children I got good news. If you turn to Jesus in the midst of the calamity, in the midst of what's going on, who knows? Maybe he'll relent and leave a blessing. Who knows? Maybe he'll restore that broken relationship. Who knows, maybe the addiction that you're struggling with right now that you have, are deciding to give up won't be passed to the next generation because you've decided right now to give my life to Jesus, to completely render it all to him. I'm breaking the chain. I'm not giving this to my children. Who knows, my marriage is on the rocks. I don't know if I'm going to stay or if I'm going to go, but you choose to turn to Jesus in your life And your relationship is restored and redeemed in those things that your children may struggle with, the insecurities and the frustrations and and the inability to feel close and have trust in somebody. Maybe those things, who knows, maybe he'll leave a blessing and, and show that in spite of a difficult situation, in spite of things that you've walked through, in spite of all of that, Jesus is still good. He's inviting us today with a holy fear and a holy reverence of who he is. I'm going to ask every head bowed, every eye closed in this room. Two things we need to remember as Christ followers is one, God is just. But two, his mercy triumphs over judgment. So if you're in this place and You know you have some issues in your life that you want to bring to the cross. This isn't saying, I want to give my life to Jesus. This is for people who do, but this is also for people who have already given their lives to Jesus, but they're still struggling with something. And they want to bring their their sin to the cross so that they can get forgiveness, that they can walk in a place and say, you know what, this sin issue, this struggle that I'm walking through, it ends with me. My children won't have to deal with this because I'm choosing to address it through the blood of Jesus today. If that's you in this room, with nobody looking around, just me, so I can see you, so I can pray with you, so I can know you, if you have something in your life, 
that you say, today, Cooper, I am giving it up. I'm walking away from it. I'm covering it under the blood of Jesus, and I'm leaving it at his feet. If that's you today, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up in, this, in, in the air and count of three. One, two, three. I see your hand. More importantly, God sees your hand. The hands aren't magical. Raising your hand's not magical. The reality is you, in this moment, have chosen to lay it down at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I give this to you so that my children don't have to carry it on. My children don't have to fight against it. My children won't be punished for the sins that I've chosen to leave and live in my life. God, we thank you for your mercy that it triumphs over judgment. We thank you for the cross that was the perfect sacrifice, that we can live underneath that blood of Jesus, that we can operate there in that space with you, knowing that we sin, Jesus dies, Jesus dies, we are in relationship with the Father. And the best part about that is Jesus died for our sins, but he rose again so that we could live in eternity with you. If you're in this room today, and you don't know Jesus, and you want that relationship, you're like, you know what, my life, Cooper, has been a mess. I'm addicted. I have, you know, I, I look at things on my computer I shouldn't be looking at. I, I, I haven't been the best husband. I haven't been the best wife. I haven't been the best father. I haven't been the best mother. I haven't been all of these things, and I realize today that it's because I don't know Jesus, because really, when you come to Jesus, it doesn't fix everything, but it gives you hope. I would argue, because I don't want you to be naive, I would argue that when you come to Jesus, the enemy will attack you and it gets harder. But the good news is, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the undefeated reigning champion of the entire universe who holds the whole thing in the palm of his hand is on your side. And it tells us that no weapon formed against us will prosper. So if you're in this room today and you say, Cooper, I want to give my life to Jesus, I want today to be the day that I stop running. I stop having a God on my, that's seated on the throne of my heart that's addiction, that's money, that's, that's myself. I want to give that up and give it back to Jesus. If that's you today, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, Jesus loves you. Two, you will never be the same. Three, if that's you, go ahead and shoot your hand in the sky right now. Okay, I see your hand. Jesus, as we come before you today and we sit reverently with you, even if you didn't raise your hand today, but that was the cry of your heart. I feel like somebody in this room, that's the cry of their heart, and they were just too scared to raise their hand today. I'm going to tell you this. There's nothing magical about raising your hand. I didn't pray a specific prayer that allowed me to give my life to the Lord. I said, Jesus, I'm sorry. I know you love me, and I know you're real, and I will live my life for you. That was my prayer. Not a cookie cutter prayer that repeat after me. It was literally in my own voice, in my own heart, in my own head as I was being hugged by somebody who was showing me the love of Jesus in that moment. So you don't have to raise your hand. But the Bible tells us that we have to repent, which means turn from the life that we have and turn to Jesus and accept him as Lord and Savior of our life. Confess with our tongue and believe in our heart that we have been saved, that Jesus is Lord and he forgives us. If that's you today, I want you to think about that as you're sitting there. It's no special prayer. Just simply say, Jesus, I've, I've messed up. I've sinned. I've fallen short. But today I choose to return to you. I choose to live a life that's pursuing you. I choose to accept you as not only Savior, but Lord of my life. God, we thank you for those people in this place that have given their lives to you. We love you, Father. And as John Mark Comer said in his book, it's so good. I want to end with this thought. We sin. Jesus dies. Jesus dies. We live on in our relationship with our Father. For those of you that made that decision today, whether you raised your hand or not, and those of you that are in the kingdom of heaven already, I'm going to say it again because we all need this reminder. Welcome to the kingdom of God. What a beautiful life we get to live. Jesus, it's in your mighty name 
If you just prayed or have any questions at all, feel free to let us know.